So, um, I want you to think back to that great day when Jesus fed 5,000. I mean, it was an amazing day. You remember that? Even if you haven't been to church very much, you remember that because everybody kind of talks about that. If you've been in, if you've been in, in any VBS classes, if in any little kid classes, you've heard about the feeding of the 5,000. All four of the gospel writers testify about it. It affected, come on, 5,000 people. So lots and lots of people were there. It's the biggest, biggest miracle. Jesus pours out this tremendous compassion on people because they were with him all day. It was late in the day. They were hungry. Jesus feeds them with the little boy's lunch. Just as amazing as that day was, the following day is just as puzzling. It's not talked about very much. But on the next day from feeding of 5,000, and no, there wasn't a lot of indigestion and all that, but the next day, by the way, they got to eat everything they wanted. They were leftovers. There was so much to eat. This wasn't like a little snack. Okay, we're feeding 5,000. How can we split this up so that everybody gets an equal share? No, there's leftovers. Everybody gets to eat to their fill. On the next day, though, this is not talked about as much. A bunch of people come back from the 5,000. We don't know how many, but it's a pretty big crowd, and they're looking for Jesus. They finally find Jesus, and Jesus refuses to feed them. Isn't that weird? That's just bizarre. Jesus feeds 5,000 people the very next day. Mm, no, got nothing for you. And they wanted food. So what's going on there? Before I answer that, let's do a review. This, this year, we are talking about this concept of life with Jesus. In fact, it's right up there on the wall. Live life with Jesus, the first line. Life with Jesus. We've been focusing for these four weeks. We're in week number three of with, because I read this book by Scott Jathani, and it's really been a cool book to help understand this idea that God wants us to be partners with Him. God wants us to walk through life with Him. God wants a relationship, us, wants us to have a relationship with Him. <clears throat> with is a great word. But there are other words we could talk about that often pull us away from with. One of those words is under. We talked about this last week. Under actually is a, is a good word. That's not a bad word. Because we should be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, right? He should lead us. The problem is if we covered up with and we didn't talk about with and we only talked about under, then it's all about living a life, following moral rules, doing your best to obey, and you never feel like you can live up. And the reason you can't feel like you can never live up is because you can't. You can never live up to the expectations of God because God's a holy, perfect God. And that's why He sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay our sin debt to live the life we couldn't live and substitute for us. He becomes our substitutionary atonement. He dies in our place because we can't do it. So if you're only living under here without a relationship with Him, but you're living under the rules of God, trying your best to live a moral life, you're just performing for God. You're just working for your relationship with God. And when you do that, there's a whole lot of guilt and shame that comes with it. That's what we talked about last week. I want to change the word this week. Today, I want us to talk about from... From. Now, from is a good word as well. I don't want you to get the wrong impression that all of these are just bad words. It is a really good word unless you take away with. If you're only going to live your life from God because He's the one that supplies all things. In fact, we're told that for every good gift, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. If you're going to just focus though on from, that's where it becomes dangerous. Every good gift comes from God. God is a giver. God wants to provide. The problem is what we do so often is when we live a, a relationship without, if we live with God, Without with God, if we don't live with God, that's what I'm trying to say. If we don't live with God and all we're doing is, is, is enjoying the benefits of God. That's dangerous. That's where we get in trouble, because even good things in our life can be elevated to a level of adultery. In fact, that's what a definition of, a, of idol worship is. An idol is usually a good gift, a good gift in life elevated to an ultimate thing. And you can talk about anything you want that you focus your life on that's good because God is a good gift giver. God provides for you.
considered that maybe your prayer lives are like a vending machine? Are you an A4 prayer person or a C7 prayer person or a D5 prayer person? Where you go up to God and say, God, I need, I need, I need. This is what I need today. If God opened up in heaven like the prayer log, and I think He has one, He's recorded all your prayers. If He's recorded our tears, He's probably recorded our prayers. And, and, and He starts reading them back to you. If He starts reading back your prayers, would you get a little uncomfortable and kind of shift in your seat a little bit as you realize all those prayers are about you? All those prayers are about what you can get from God. God, I need, and God, I need, I need finances to be met. I need uh, health uh, doctor's report to come back good. And God, what I need is this relationship to be mended. And God, what I need for my kids is, and God, what I need safety. I need protection. I need you to put your hedge of protection around them. I don't even know what that means, but I want you to put a hedge of protection around them because I heard some preacher say that one time. Is God going to grow an actual hedge around them? This is what we do, right? We pray these things like we're selecting them from a vending machine, don't we? We treat God like He exists to supply what we need or desire. And the problem is we treat the gift higher than we treat God. We're more interested in what He can give us than the giver of all good things. We take the good thing and we run with it and we elevate it. I want to give you three examples quickly in the Old Testament of how this happens, just so you know you're not alone and I'm not alone in doing this. We're not. This isn't like a 21st century problem that all of a sudden we're like elevating our kids beyond belief to a high level of idol, idol worship. This is not just this day and age. This happens. In fact, you could open the Bible just about anywhere and what you'll find are two things. First of all, you're going to find that God blesses people like crazy. You'll open it up and you'll find that God's blessing somebody. And then you'll find that the people are taking those gifts that God blesses them with and making that their faith, making that their religion, making that their focus. Because isn't that what religion is, what we focus on? You can be religious about anything. So I want to give you three examples, and they're just quick examples. You could probably pick your own examples as you go through the Bible. I'll just start with Abraham and Sarah. If you remember, Abraham and Sarah wanted so badly to have a child because she was barren. But over the years, they kind of forgot about it because for they, they got up into the old age and they, they weren't able to have children. And then God shows up and starts telling them, you guys are going to have a baby. In fact, this child is going to be great. And, and this child from his descendants are going to be so many descendants, it's like going to be as many as the stars are in the sky if you could even count that high. And they're like blown away. God is going to provide for us a child. We're old in age. We've not had any children. This is crazy, but it's crazy good. From that point forward, though, they got fixated on the idea of a child. They could not get it off their minds. That's all they thought about. God was waiting because God was preparing things for this child to come. They were getting impatient because all they could think about was the child, the gift. See, it doesn't have to be a monetary gift. It doesn't have to be a possession. All they could think about was the gift. And they did the unthinkable. And Sarah took her maidservant and had her go in and sleep with Abraham so that she would conceive and they would have the child by the maidservant. That's crazy, but that's what we do. Maybe not in that way, but we get all caught up in the gift rather than the giver. Let me give you a second example. The book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges is one long history that chronicles a problem that Israel had. It's several hundred years of them getting caught up in sin and into bondage and crying out for mercy from God to free them from bondage, and then they get freed because God sends a judge as a deliverer. It's that freedom that's their gift. They've been delivered. They have peace now. And what happens when we have peace? We get comfortable. We enjoy it. Instead of doing life with God as the giver of good times, we take good times as, as, as the focus and we get all caught up. This is part of America's problem. We're getting all caught up in the good times and in, in, in all the, all the uh, consumerism that we have. We can buy anything we want. We can get second day shipping. Thank you, Prime. We get all caught up in that. And so the pattern just kept continuing. They fell back into sin. They went into bondage. They cried out to God. God delivered them. They got all comfortable because God gave them peace. 
they started sinning again and getting caught up in sin and bondage to sin and they got oppressed and they cried out to God and it went over and over and over. That's what the book of Judges is all about. So this is not just about stuff or money that we get all uh, too much into in worship. We can worship anything that's good. We can, we can take anything and promote it to the highest level. And that becomes an idol. Uh, well, last, last one is the promised land. Israel was enslaved to Egypt and cried out to God and God sent plagues down and delivered them. They crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground. They started wandering in the wilderness and God promised them a land. A land that was so amazing and good because God is a good giver. God gives good gifts. And so when He provides a land, this is going to be the best land you can imagine. And it was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. And we're like, eh, what in the world? Who wants to walk around in sticky stuff like that? But that's not what it meant. It meant you're going to have so much cattle that the milk will continue to flow. The cows are going to give you so much milk because you're going to have herds and herds of cattle. Oh, 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 and the, the, the greenery and the, and the, and the, and, and the trees and the flora and it's all going to be lush and you're going to have flowers and you're going to have trees and you're going to have fruit and you're, it's going to be so great that there's going to be so much nectar and so much pollen. There's going to be bees that are going to be busy like crazy trying to take care of all of those flowers that they're going to be producing all this sweet, sweet honey for you. They're not even realizing that they're going to work for you so that you can have so much honey and so much milk and you're going to just be loving this land. I'm giving you this land. It's going to be amazing because God's a good gift giver. All right? Before though they get to go in, God gives them a warning. Here's their warning. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands and His laws and His decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, because I'm going to give you so much food, it's going to be crazy how much food I'm going to give you. And when you build your fine houses, because I'm going to give you trees and wood and settle down, because I'm going to give you peace. And when your herds and flocks grow large, because you're going to have cattle like crazy and your silver and gold increase, because you're going to have wealth and all you have is multiplied because I'm a good gift giver, God says. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And that's exactly what happened. How could that happen? Come on, no way that could happen. It happens the same way it happens with us. Same way it happens with us. We can so easily replace our relationship with God by, let's say, making our children our idols. Or let's say, by making our health our idol. Or our money our idol. Or our popularity our idol. Or our sports our idol. Or our careers our idol. Anything, right? We can put anything in that place. Because we just love, love, love God so much. When in fact we really, really love, 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 love God's gifts so much. Am I right? I see this played out every day when I come home. Every day. When I come home, there are two cats that greet me at the door. Actually, one cat. The other one's slow. So there's, there's the white cat, which is cotton, and she's the calico, and she's got white, brown spots. Then Albert eventually gets there. He's, he's not the quickest cat. We actually nickname him Fat Albert, and I think you can probably guess why. I don't help the matter because the reason that they come to the, that, that door and, and they love on me and they meow and they rub up against my leg is because I'm a softie and I always reach in and grab a little handful of Friskies treats. Now, Friskies are little, little treats that are shaped like little fish and little chicken and another shape that looks kind of weird because how do you shape the flavor of liver? Not really sure. Now, I don't know that it tastes like liver. That's what the package says, okay? I've never eaten cat food in my life. Dog food I had once. I was little. It was all right. So, I feed them a handful of Frisky's treats. Not only that, but I have to confess, uh, I'm, a, I'm a softie when it comes to animals. Off of my dinner plate, sometimes they might get a little piece of meat. 
as well. I'm the one that they come begging because they know I'm soft, right? I'm the one that's going to get them the treats. So you would think because I come home and I give them little friskies and I am the, always the one that's giving them a little bit of food from my plate. I try to do it slyly, but I'm always caught. They always know. You would think that I would be their favorite. I'm the giver of good gifts. I'm not their favorite. Their favorite is Caden. They love Caden. They sit on Caden's lap when he's on the couch. They sleep with Caden, both of them. They find a way to get all curled up next to Caden in bed. Those two tiny cats. <laughs> but isn't that how we treat God? He is the giver of good gifts. And we're like, oh, I just love those treats. Those treats are so good. We forget that we're supposed to do life with God. You ever wonder if maybe sometimes he withholds gifts from us just because he wants to bless us, but he doesn't want us to get so caught up in the gift that we miss the giver and we're not with him, right? I think this is why God early on established this idea in the Old Testament. Early on, he said, I want you to take the first part of everything you receive and I want you to give back a portion. It was called a tithe. We don't really use the word tithe anymore, but it means a tenth. I want you to give back a tenth. And he was very strict about this. I want it to be a tenth of everything. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belong to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. He says, I don't want you to, I don't want you to miss a single thing. Every fruit that comes in, every crop that comes in, anything you get when you, tr when you do your bartering and your trading and you earn money, everything, 10%. And what he was doing was training their hearts. Because if they did not give back or be generous at all to others, then they would never appreciate the gift giver. Now, did God need anything given back? Does God need anything? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need anything, right? Any more than I need anything back from my cats, but wouldn't it be cool? Well, I, they do give me stuff back. It's not the stuff I want. Wouldn't it be cool, though, if one of those cats, you know, with his nose, took one of those little pieces of friskies, maybe the, the shape of the fish, and starts with his nose just pushing it towards me? First of all, it'd be like, this cat is demon-possessed. But if I really truly caught on to what he was doing, and, or she was doing, just giving back. Just saying, I want you to know I appreciate what you have done in my life because I know that sometimes I can get so caught off guard and think, I earned this, or I made this, or I deserve this. Don't we do that? But if we would give back. So God made, it, made sure it was in His law, you were to give back. Now in the New Testament, the people in the New Testament, they were, because of Jesus dying on the cross and raising again, they were giving away property, selling stuff to give. They were not even concerned about, is it 10%? They were way above that. But God set a number long, long ago because He knew that if we weren't trained in that duty, in that responsibility, in that structure, in that law, we would never develop a heart of generosity. And generosity is what is going to set us free. The best way to stop loving the gift more than the giver is to be generous. The absolute best way. So I'm, some of us need to just think about, am, am, I, am I generous? Am I truly giving back and giving to others? Or am I trying to just Pretend that it's enough by what I throw in the pot or throw at others. We have to examine our hearts. Because honestly, it, it, it's not about the amount. It's about whether it truly is something that makes you stop and think and say, I'm not the one who made this. My hands are completely open. God owns all of this. I am demonstrating to Him that I'm giving back to Him. I'm demonstrating that I love the giver more than the gift. I know this is not easy. It is not easy. Especially when we talk about money, it's not easy. But it's not easy with anything. <laughs> Just a week ago, we were at, uh, in Crawfordsville and, and at the regional final game and 
uh, Angie's sister and her, her uh, husband came up, and it was a great visit. We had dinner, and then she said, oh, before you go in, let's uh, stop in the parking lot, and I need to give you a gift. And, and so we met her in the parking lot, and she gave us this gift. It was a box, and we opened it up, and inside were donuts, which kind of surprised me. I'm like, donuts? That's the gift? Come on, it's, you know, it's cold out here. Let's go inside and get good seats for the game and donuts. I'm not a big, you know, I don't eat a lot of donuts. So, you know, I'm not really into donuts. And, and yet she starts telling us this story and the, that these donuts are special. These donuts come from a bakery in Batesville. She lives pretty close to Batesville. And they are only made one time a year over the weekend of Washington's birthday. And they're made with wild cherries. They're like wild cherry thingies. I think that's what they're called. And, and they're just amazing. People drive for miles to get there to get these donuts. And people wait an hour or two, two hours to get these donuts. And I waited, and I can't remember how long, but it was a long time. And so I'm like, dang, i got to eat a donut. obligation, right? So both Angie and I, and they were cold, so they weren't warmed up, and it was cold out there, so in the middle of the parking lot, we're both biting into this donut. I got to tell you, that was the best donut I have ever had. Oh, it was like, you know, I, if you know anything about me, you know I love pie, and I love cherry pie, and it was like having a cherry pie that was ooey gooey. It was just amazing. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is, this is so good, and now I see why people wait. I'm not sure an hour and a half, but I can see why people wait. And so, you know, if, if Pam had said to me before I took a bite, Jeff, could I have one of those donuts back? I'd be like, sure, you bought them. You can have all of them back. You want them all back? Just take them. After that bite, though, I was like, these are mine. My precious, right? Don't we do that with our stuff and our things? And, and, and so we, I know it's not easy because we just get so focused in on how good the gift is because God is a good gift giver that we just completely stop doing life with Him. We just want more from Him. And we've got to learn to be generous or we're going to stay in this trap. So, let's go back to what I asked earlier, and that is, how could Jesus on one day feed 5,000 and on the next day say, no, I'm not going to feed you? <laughs> what changed? I mean, it's crazy, right? Jesus Himself tells us what changed. He said this, Very truly, I tell you, this is on day two, you're looking for Me, not because you saw the signs I performed, you weren't overawed about me. You weren't like, oh man, this guy's amazing. But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You really liked the food. And all you're coming here for isn't me. It's what you can get from me. You're just here for another free lunch. And Jesus is like, that's not why I'm here. Don't get so caught up in the gift. You miss the giver. In fact, Jesus flips the analogy and puts it on himself and says, I am the bread of life. Hunger and thirst for me. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Make your life about me, not what you can get from me. Together we're going to do amazing things, Jesus says. We're going to change lives. We're going to make impact. We're going to bring about conviction and repentance and salvation. But without me, you can do nothing. Remain in me. Be grafted in me. Hunger and thirst for me. Not what you can get from me. So I want to ask you this question. If you got absolutely nothing more from Jesus. Nothing more. Not one more gift. Would Jesus still be enough? Let me flip the question around. If you lost everything, 
if Jesus allowed everything to be taken away? Would Jesus be enough? I know you want to answer, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not an easy question to answer, is it? Because we're comfortable. Again, we're like the people in the book of Judges who have peace. I mean, not every area of our life is absolutely peaceful, but it's in the great span of history, aren't we living in a pretty peaceful time? In the great span of history, aren't we living in a very affluent time? And certainly a very affluent place. It is so easy for us to think that this is expected. God, this is the way you're supposed to. This is how you're supposed to give us life. We expect this from you. I truly believe the reason we are enjoying what we're enjoying is because we are blessed by God. Let us never, ever, ever take that for granted. Let's return to the gift giver and thank him and love him and do life with him again. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to come on up here. We offer an invitation every week. And um, the, the reality is God is a great gift giver, but we can't really just talk about the things and the stuff and the freedom and the peace without talking about the biggest gift he gives. He sent his son into this world to die for you for your sins because your sin debt separates you from God. You can't have a relationship with him. You can't be with him. He is a holy God. And yet Jesus died in your place so that you can have that relationship. The greatest gift is Jesus. And if you don't have a relationship with him, I want to invite you to come up while we sing. If you need prayer, if you have other decisions, I want to invite you to come. This is your time of decision. Maybe the yellow card is what you need to use during this decision time. Write down a prayer. Or maybe write down one more information about baptism, salvation, those things. That's what it's there for. This is your time of decision. So I'm going to ask that you stand as we pray. Father God, this morning we come to you as those who have been blessed richly in so many ways. And God, I, I, I know how easy it is for me to get caught off guard by stuff and by position and, and by abilities. And God, I know that at the same time, you're still there and you're still wanting that relationship with me. And I'm praying that you help each of us to not just make our life about how we can get something from you. And we know you're an awesome provider and that you want to provide. And we pray for things because we know that you want, if they're in your will, to do that in our life. But at the same time, more than anything, you want a relationship with us. Help us not to get sidetracked by the gifts you give. Help us to love you, the giver. Father, if there's anyone in this room who needs a relationship with you, I pray for the courage to step out and come forward at this time. We ask for this in Jesus' name.